Greetings in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. I welcome you to this midweek Bible study as we continue our study of the letter to the Philippians written by Paul and Timothy to this strategic church. He's bringing his letter down to a close here and he's he's moving into some personal things but also some concerns he has and some uh, suggestions and exhortation. At the end of chapter 3, he's reminding us that there are enemies of the cross. Here, here's what he says, verse 18 of chapter 3. For I have often told you and now say again with tears that many live as enemies of the cross of Christ. Uh, we're going to talk about that a little bit today. Their end is destruction, their God is their stomach, their glory is in their shame. So he's saying that there are people that are organized to undermine and corrupt the church. They're enemies of the cross, and it was false teachers, and it was people that were more interested in in personalities and and doing things that would was um, watered down the gospel. Part of them were called Judaizers. These were Jews that had become believers that taught that in order to be a Christian, you had to also be, embrace and become a, a Jew. You, and so Paul's confronting that, and he says they are focused on earthly things, but our citizenship is in heaven, from which we also eagerly wait for a Savior, the Lord Jesus. So our our focus is on Jesus. Our focus is, is on His teachings and being true and pure to that. And it says, He will transform the body of our humble condition into the likeness of His glorious body by the power that enables us to subject everything to Himself. And that refers back to where Paul is praying that he said, and my goal is to know him, uh, verse 10 of chapter 3. My goal is to know him, and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings, being conformed to his death, assuming that I will somehow reach the resurrection from among the dead. So he's, he's uh, given us this future hope and on our journey of, of faithfulness in Christ, that we will attain this this glorious resurrection. But then he he moves from this theological uh, teaching here, and he he gets personal. Here's what he says in verse one. So then, of chapter four. So then, in this way, my dearly loved brothers, my joy and crown. Stand firm in the Lord, dear friends. So he's he, he's expressing his love for them. Paul, Paul is basically, if you could summarize what he says in verse 1, he, he's, saying, he's saying, I love you. And um, he, he considers them friends, dear friends. But because they're friends then, he is hammering again. It's a theme that he has throughout not only the Philippian letter, but in several of his other letters. He, he, he gives this exhortation. He is uh, embracing them. Me and my dear friends, I love you, basically. Your brothers and sisters in the Lord. And, and uh, you know, he, those of us that have, uh, I've had uh, very meaningful pastorates. I was at Zion Baptist Church in Henderson, Kentucky for over 16 years. And when I think of those folks there, I, it brings joy to me. We had, we had, we, we were blessed to be there. Those people are still part of, of my life. But my hope for them is what Paul's hope was for those people in Philippi. I'm sure Brother Kevin feels the same way about Horse Cape Baptist Church, 27 years of investment. So here's, here's what Paul's hope is, not only for the church in Philippi, but all the churches that were founded by Paul and others and including Horse Cape Baptist Church in 2024. He wants us to stand firm. Listen to what he said earlier in the letter. We, we've kind of gone back to these verses many times. But he says in 
chapter 1, verses 27 and 28. Just one thing, he says. Live your life in a manner worthy of the gospel. Then whether I come and see you or am absent, I will hear that you are standing firm, working, uh, standing firm in one spirit, with one mind, working side by side for the faith of the gospel, not being frightened in any way by your opponents. So he's here, he's, he's coming back to this theme again. He's kind of bringing the letter down to a, you know, to, to a conclusion, but his theme is the same. He, he wants these people that he loves in the Lord. He wants them to stand firm, working side by side. And then he, he kind of describes what that is to be. He says, I want you to be in one spirit. That is the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit unites us. It's the, the commonality that we have, the Holy Spirit living in us. And then he, one mind, and he, 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 he gets into that in chapter two. He said, have this mind in you, verse five, have this mind or this attitude in you that was also in Christ Jesus. And he gives us his great teachings about what Christ has done, how he stepped out of eternity into time and took upon the form of a servant and, uh, and became obedient to the point of death, even death on the cross. So we're to be servants. How do you stand firm? You have the mind of Christ. You, you uh, begin to think and act and live like Jesus. Now, he, he, he wants us to know then, as he gives this admonition, this exhortation, he wants us to know that they're enemies of the cross, that, that there, are, there are opponents do not be frightened away by your opponents. So in 2024, what are some of the opponents? What are some of the enemies that we have to confront? And, 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 and part of that is, part of what we have to confront is the ways of the world. Now Paul has this standing firm theme throughout his writings because he knows that this is a this is going to be a a constant it's not going to go away he says in 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 corinthians chapter at the end of the first letter to the corinthians in chapter 16 he says in verse 13 be alert stand firm in the faith be brave and strong your every action must be done in love. And then he says it again in, in Galatians uh, chapter 5, verse 1. Christ has liberated us into freedom. Therefore, stand firm. He ends the Ephesian letter with this, you know, this admonition to put on the full armor of God so that we can stand firm. And uh, he wants us to be have our, he says, stand therefore with truth like a belt around your waist, righteousness like armor in your, on your chest, and your feet sandaled with the readiness of the gospel. This is verse 14 of Ephesians 6. In every situation, take the shield of faith, and with it you'll be able to extinguish the flaming arrows of the evil one. Take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is God's Word. So he knows that there is, a, there is an onslaught of, uh, of people and, and issues in the world that seeks to water down and, and basically to... Uh, to make the gospel ineffective, to make churches ineffective. And so we know that, that in the world, the, 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 it has its, the world has its allurements and its advertisements, that, that endeavor that seek to, to entice us to abandon or at least minimize the impact of the truth of Scripture in our lives. 
it, it's if you watch television or if you you know you get online or you you got one of these phones you know you're constantly bombarded with stuff and some of it looks really good you know it sounds good but the truth is its end is destruction uh, so the world then is organized against God. It's, it's organized against the church. And our, our task then, our calling, our expectations of being citizens of the kingdom of heaven is to live according to the, the ways and the teachings of the life of Jesus. And anything that takes away from that, anything that, that, that adulterates that, anything that corrupts that, anything that, that, um, that gets us off track then hurts the church. And one of my concerns is the generations that are coming behind us, um, particularly the, the teenagers, and now even the 20 year olds what research has been done recently by a group called the barna group they're a christian organization out of california that i have used before and know some of these people and and uh, kentucky today our kentucky baptist convention puts out a newsletter every every day five days a week and recently, they put an article in there about the research Barna has done with preteens, eight to twelve-year-olds, and it it was it was alarming to me. I've I've seen this and known it for a while, but the numbers are are alarming of what what they discovered, and 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 what they've discovered is that these preteens are on track to abandon biblical Christianity in record numbers. And there were, there were five areas. I'm, I'm not going to share all five of them, but the two that just kind of jumped out at me, and actually there was three, but one is their view of the Bible. These are, these are preteens, eight to 12-year-olds. This is what they're being taught or not taught, either at home, are at, are at church. Now we know that schools are not teaching, they're not teaching biblical truth. But it's our responsibility as parents and grandparents and influencers and certainly leaders in the church to uh, make sure that we're passing the baton to this next generation, to help them stand firm. So part of our Paul's admonition then to these people that he loves, he's not only thinking about the current ones, he's thinking about their kids and their kids and their kids, the next generations that are going to be in Philippi. Philippi was a pagan city in the midst of a pagan culture. And he's and as, as were these other churches, Corinth and, and Galatia and others, they were pagan places and Paul wants to make sure that they were standing firm and passing the faith on to the to the next generation and that ge next generation and the next generation and so here's what they learned the Barney group learned about these eight to twelve year olds uh, what they believe about the Bible only 60 percent of them had ever read any part of the Bible and I, I would think that's that was probably high. Most, most of them aren't, aren't reading the Bible. And, and only 20% of that group study view the Bible as a source of authority or truth in determining right and wrong. So where are they learning? Where are they learning right and wrong? Well, they're learning it from the culture. They're learning it from, you know, it doesn't matter what you believe, whatever makes you feel good. And, you know, and the second thing that's a corollary to that is that only one in three of those eight to 12 year olds um, believes there's any such thing as absolute truth. 
you know, they they just, you know, they, 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 you know, it's, it's uh, truth is relative. It's whatever is right for you, and that's that's what the culture has been teaching really for years. But it's certainly been accelerated in the last twenty years for sure, and particularly even now. And 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 so the the, the third piece that they discovered, and, and this has been true now for really for about 40 years, but it's it's really coming to crystallize in this generation, is they don't believe that that salvation is through Jesus alone. They it's whatever, you know. And they don't see uh, they just don't see that they need to come they need to come to Christ. And if they do, then it doesn't mean that their friends need to come to Christ. They can believe in whatever they want to. It's almost a, a universalism. And, and and the alarming thing is they're learning this stuff at home or not learning it. They're not learning the truth at home. So my encouragement to you is to stand firm in the Lord. We're going to talk next week. Paul gives seven ways here in these next, in, in verses 1 through seven of chapter four of ways to stand firm and we're going to look at that next week but i just wanted to raise up this need like horse cave baptist church we we've got to target the next generation we've got to target teenagers and children and the truth is that if these boys and girls don't come to christ by the time they're 13 or 14 years old the, the chances of them reaching them gets really hard so part of our Part of our burden, our passion, part of our strategy has got to be a pastor that has a burden to reach the next generation and the church is willing to adapt and change and, and restructure itself to reach these generations, this next generation, these, these children, these preteens, the teenagers, and even these 20-year-olds. It can't be just for us. <laughs> And so we've got to love these generations with the love of Christ. And that's my prayer. And uh, so you pray about that. And you think about that. That's going I'll say more about that probably from the pulpit in the coming days. But uh, that's certainly Paul's passion. And it's certainly my passion. I hope it'll be yours. <laughs>